Hi, I'm Tracy White, and welcome to Community Louisiana on Your View. Today, we're highlighting groups who are making a real difference in the communities of Louisiana. First, we'll take an inspirational look at 100 Louisiana students who overcame adversity to thrive and achieve. Then, we'll find out about everything you need to do to stay prepared this hurricane season. Next, it's education that meets the needs of Louisiana industries and offers its students a better life at ITI. Finally, meet the heroes in our community who are helping to preserve and protect the environment for us all. But first, we all need a little inspiration and these students are here to provide it. Meet the Cox Inspirational Heroes. On behalf of Cox Communications and Anthony Pope, our Senior Vice President and Regional Manager, I'd like to welcome all of you to our 2019-27 27th Annual Cox Inspirational Heroes Award Program. So in 1992, this program began in a small hall in Jefferson Parish with only 38 heroes. Here we are today, 27 years later, honoring our 2019 inspirational student heroes who have joined thousands of students already recognized since the beginning of this program. We're thrilled to honor each of you for your outstanding accomplishments, unwavering courage, and positive attitudes. This is your special day. We also have a deep appreciation for youth and education. James M. Cox, the founder of our company, began his career as an educator, which is why we support schools and organizations that make a positive difference in the lives of our young people. Christopher Reeve, who the world knows as one of the most popular superheroes, Superman, once said, I think a hero is an ordinary individual who finds strength to persevere and endure in spite of overwhelming obstacles. Each of our honorees found the strength to persevere despite facing physical, emotional, psychological, and our social challenges. Uh, this is actually one of the best events in our region every single year with the work that Cox does to recognize the heroes in the room. But we all know that most superheroes have a sidekick, and you have those sidekicks right beside you. They may be a parent, it may be a grandparent, it may be a family friend. So those sidekicks in the room, keep helping these heroes be as awesome as they can every single day. So, on behalf of the entire St. Charles Parish Public School System, our superintendent, Felicia Gomez-Walker, congratulations to all of the inspirational heroes we wish you continued success in the future, and thank you to Cox for continuing to sponsor this event and recognizing our students. The one common characteristic of all of these students in this ceremony is that they have never given up. Thank you to the Cox Inspirational Heroes Program for giving the students of St. Bernard and the Greater New Orleans area the opportunity to be recognized for their special talents in and out of the classroom for the past 27 years. And that concludes our presentation for the 2019 Cox Inspirational Heroes. Again, let's give all of our heroes a big round of applause to their families and all of their teachers as well. Cox is proud to recognize these outstanding winners and to share their stories with you all. We wish them all the best of luck in the future. Next up on Community Louisiana, find out what you need to do to keep you and your family safe this hurricane season in Louisiana. Don't miss it. Warm weather in the Bayou State means many things. There's sunshine, festivals, and lots of fun outdoor activities. But it also means something not so fun, hurricane season. Our own David Dockin caught up with GOSEP to find out what you need to do to stay prepared this summer and beyond. 
Hi there, I'm David Dockan, Public Affairs for Cox across Louisiana. One of the things that we're doing to help you get ready for this hurricane season is coming to pay a visit to the Governor's Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness, and we're here with the director now. Director Wascom, thank you so much for taking time out. You today. bet. So, as we prepare for hurricane season, a lot of people in Louisiana know the drill, but uh, we know that a lot of people also are starting to move into the state and we're seeing a lot of transition. So before hurricane season even starts, yes. what do people need to do to stay safe? Uh, you need to have an evacuation plan. Uh, you need to uh, determine where you're gonna go. Along with that, you need to have an emergency cash fund because power goes out and you can't get access to the bank or to the uh, automated teller machines. So you need to have that. You need to go ahead and stock uh, some uh, your prescription medications, keep those with you, and just have what we call a go pack with you that, that has all your essential paperwork and, and things of that so that you can get out of there um, when you're asked to leave. Now, a lot of times people are going to be out of the area after a storm hits. They've evacuated. Can they go to your website to get information yes. about what's being done? Yes. What kind of information do you guys provide there? Well, we provide, first of all, the uh, uh, Department of Transportation puts out a website, 511LA.org, that tells you what roads are open so you can uh, get in. The other thing we do is uh, we uh, coordinate or we put out information from the parishes on reentry. So uh, each parish controls their own reentry program after a disaster because they don't want folks going back in when it's unsafe. You may have power lines down, you may have roads that are flooded, uh, things of that nature. So we, we are kind of the, the voice uh, that I mentioned, the Joint Information Center, we get that word out to, to the folks there. We have a website as well. Uh, in times of disaster, also www.emergency.la.gov. Uh, that's, that's the source where they can go for all of that. And, you know, we talk a lot about GOSEP and what it is that you do, but in reality, you have the house where all the experts come, right? Because it's not just your agency that's, that's here. Correct. What other kind of agencies are here so, during an disaster? So in addition to the, uh, there's 21 uh, state agencies, cabinet agencies that are part of the Unified Command Group. So they're all, they're all in here. Uh, you have search and rescue, emergency services personnel, you have health and hospitals, you have an infrastructure branch. Our federal partners are key. We work with them on a daily basis, uh, in the past month an hourly basis uh, with the river flooding. That's the Corps of Engineers, uh, obviously the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Uh, we also uh, work closely with the Coast Guard um, and, and a number of other federal, federal agencies uh, in times of disaster. And now I'd like to welcome Assistant Deputy Director of Emergency Management, Chris Gilbo. Chris, thanks for joining us today. Now, one of the biggest questions we know people have is after the storm, people want to know when are the first responders going to respond to me? When is the work going to start? How do you guys determine when we go from storm mode to recovery mode? Okay, so obviously the response is, is well uh, before the actual storm hits. We start doing a tremendous amount of task uh, to prepare for both prepare the citizens, and that may also include a full evacuation, and certainly prepare the communities that may be in danger. So we'll preposition sandbags, we'll preposition soldiers and, and wildlife and fisheries agents and boats and helicopters and all those other things, just to make sure that we have things in the right place when it comes to respond, to make sure we save lives and, and protect property to the utmost that we can. Uh, and then when we truly gotten through the life-saving missions, we've got everyone out of harm's way uh, and we stabilize the situation. A lot of people will use that word. We stabilize the situation, and that's when really when recovery starts. So, you know, if it takes pumping out of, of some areas or shoring up some levees uh, or doing other actions like that to stabilize it and to get back on the road to recovery, that's kind of when we say it's time for recovery now. If you had to give one piece of advice to the citizens of the state of Louisiana, on what they need to do before a storm enters the Gulf, what would you tell them to do? Their preparedness efforts. We take the time and energy and efforts to make sure that your first responders are prepared. We expect citizens to be just as prepared. If you are capable of taking care of yourself, if you are capable of evacuating yourself, keeping your family safe, have a plan, take action, and do that. And that would really help us. The more folks that do it for themselves, uh, the more we can concentrate on those that cannot help themselves. And that's who we want to make sure is taken care of. 
And of course, we want you to stay ahead of the storm for information all the time. You can go check out GOSEP's website. Thanks for joining us today. It's never too early to be safe and prepared when dealing with the threat of hurricanes. Take the steps necessary to be ready when, not if, one comes. When we return on Community Louisiana, we'll show you how one school is preparing their students for a better life. Stick around to find out how after the break. Welcome back. Louisiana's industries are growing and the need for skilled labor is too. One Louisiana school is meeting that challenge. They're providing quality graduates for quality jobs. Take a look at what's happening at ITI Technical College. ITI is a 43-year-old, two-year technical college. Uh, it began, my father actually began the school here in Baton Rouge. We've graduated over 10,000 graduates during that 43 year period. We look at drawings or pictures of where we started. One building on uh, 10 acres right there on Airline Highway. And uh, my dad had the foresight to know that that's where a lot of the growth was going to go. We went from one building to now we have over 60,000 square feet of uh, training area classrooms and labs. ITI is built on hands-on training. We have a full-scale pilot plant that where not only do our technicians and operators can go out there and work on the equipment in a life-size situation right there on campus, but also our draftsmen can go out there. They see what they're drawing. They can actually look at it visually and say, oh, that's what a control valve looks like. That's one of the things that I, I'm really excited about is how much lab we have in our, in our programs. Well, the most exciting news uh, program-wise is that we started the construction management program. Anytime the industry asks you to move in an area, we want to make them happy. Most of the jobs that we have in our community need a technical degree, and I feel like that's where ITI really fits the bill. 45% of our students are getting placed before they even graduate. That's pretty exciting when you have a graduation and almost half the class is already working in their field. It really saves employers a lot of money when they know they can call ITI and say, look, we have five openings in process operations. Uh, we'd like to interview 30 candidates. At ITI, we can not only set those candidates up, they can come interview them at the college. ITI was uh, just mentioned in Forbes Magazine's top 30 technical colleges in America. They ranked ITI in three areas. Uh, the first being affordability. How much does it cost to go to ITI? Number two was the quality of education. And a lot of that had to do with student to teacher ratios. And the third one was outcomes. How much money are these students making when they graduate? ITI scored so high in those areas that it pushed us up to number 24 in the nation which I'm very excited about. One of the things that's really changed at ITI now that I've noticed in my time there, and I've been there for 35 years, is that our student body has changed from uh, many being high school graduates, leaving high school, starting uh, their post-secondary education, that now we have many adult learners. I mean, the average age of an ITI student now I believe is somewhere around 27 years old. What I find when I interview students who come to the school is that um, they have a family, they have a job, so now they're trying to juggle going back to school, working, raising a family. It makes it di very difficult. With that high number of students in that category of adult learner, we're still graduating at about 78%. I remember when uh, President Obama talked about a college scorecard. I got very excited because I knew ITI would come out on top, and that's what happened. When you look across the scorecard, ITI scored in the top 10% in all categories. Our graduation rate, one of the highest in the state. Our starting salaries, one of the highest in the state. Another thing they looked at is quality of education. And I think if you're an adult learner, that's very important. You don't want to be lost in the crowd. 
You want to know that that instructor cares about you, knows you by name. The thing that I think what makes ITI so great is our staff. Our instructors care about their students. It's funny that you know they'll actually call the students to find out how come they didn't go to class last night. That type of caring, I think when the students arrive at ITI, they feel that family atmosphere that we have. They know that we really do care about them. And I think that helps them through those two years to actually go through that training to see the outcome in the end. For more information on ITI Technical College, uh, you can come and visit us at 13944 Airline Highway. Uh, you can see us on our website, iticollege.edu. Or you can call us at 1-800-467-4484. ITI is doing a fantastic job training today's students for tomorrow's jobs and offering them a better life. When we come back on Community Louisiana, we'll meet the special people in our community working hard to protect and preserve our environment. Welcome back. They're the everyday heroes who give of themselves and work tirelessly to keep our nature and our community safe. Meet this year's edition of the Cox Conserves Heroes. I love Baton Rouge. I'm a huge fan of Baton Rouge and think Baton Rouge could be as cool as any other city if everybody cared just a little bit more. You know, there's kind of this national emphasis on runners taking responsibility and doing what they call plogging, which is picking up litter while jogging. And, you know, all of us run here, we bike here, we have coffee here, and I think we need to take responsibility for it. And we love doing it. Look around at yourselves, and when we leave here in about five minutes, think of what a statement we're going to make to Baton Rouge, this big yellow wave of people that are concerned for Baton Rouge and want to make Mid-City a cleaner place. So. If you are from South Baton Rouge, you would know Jenny Peters. She has run every single square foot of this town in South Baton Rouge. I probably have looped the LSU lakes more times than most, you know, in the 38 years that I've been looping the lakes on foot. We as runners uh, are obviously going at a slow pace around our community. I think sometimes we notice that maybe the environment could use some help. And Jenny was uh, instrumental in saying, let's do what we can, our small part, to, to make it a better place for everybody in Baton Rouge. We have a prize, a $50 gift card to Varsity Sports and $25 to Radio Bar for the people that have bring in the heaviest trash. And then over behind y'all, the most interesting piece of trash is over there too. So the same prize, if you find something interesting out there on the course, bring it in. Jenny encourages us to not only to live active, healthy lives, but patronize the businesses around our community and participate in, in other active, healthy, good ways in our community. She loves integrating our activities with all of the, uh, the businesses in South Baton Rouge. So it's been a fabulous uh, 15 years, personally for me, to have met and known Jenny. It's important for runners to clean up the cities where they run in because we're directly benefiting from a clean environment. We just wanted a three city community involvement and it's been great in New Orleans. It's been huge because I picked some really interesting areas that really needed cleaning up and people are out coming out of business thanking them, people coming out of their, you know, out of their houses saying thank you for taking care of our neighborhood and you know, I want to say to them it would be nice if the whole neighborhood did, but in the meantime if we're setting a good example and you know, we each have got to do our small part. Ginny always errs on the side of giving and um, if there's ever a chance that I have to give back, I'm all in. Why did I nominate Jenny Peters? How much time do we have here? Let me tell you, she cares about this community. She cares about it from a healthy aspect, about a conservation aspect. First of all, to be awarded the Cox Conserves Heroes honor is just, was just incredible. And then to follow that up with, oh, by the way, you have $10,000 to choose a nonprofit to donate it to. It's just, I mean, you can't imagine what that feels like. Immediately I started trying to think of 
what projects would be meaningful to me. I talked to Amanda with Breck. Uh, she's in the conservation area there. We talked about the fact that the duck feeding area at City Park Lake was where so many people go, either from out of town or in town. You know, they bring their young children there and how much that could be improved. And so immediately I was drawn to that project. So Breck is the Recreation and Park Commission for the Parish of East Baton Rouge. Our job is to connect people with recreational opportunities and nature. And so Brett Conservation, um, to kind of add on to that, it's our mission to protect and preserve the natural communities of the parish, but then also to create these recreational opportunities in those uh, parks. So Jenny came to me, um, we started brainstorming on some different things that we could potentially do and that would also impact the community that she was most actively participating in. And so through that process, we found a need in what we call the Little Duck Landing um, in between our City Park Golf Course and City Park Lake. You know, I think it's gonna be a real great project. It's, you know, we're affectionately call it the duck deck, but it will be decks and walkways and hopefully cleaning up the shoreline for, uh, you know, for paddle boats and kayaks and things like that. That. We would hope to educate people about the conservation of the City Park Lake and also about their interactions with the wildlife there because we have a lot of families that come and feed the ducks bread, which is actually really bad for them. And so this would give us the opportunity to have some signage that educated them about it and then also provided a duck feeding station where they could feed ducks things that they actually can eat. This gave us the opportunity to potentially build it to a point where people could see what the final product of the lake's plan could be and it would um, allow families and fishermen and other recreational users like bikers and runners to utilize the pond in a way that we really haven't been able to in that spot before. It would increase the safety of it. You could potentially put a boat in the water. I'm really thrilled to have something so meaningful to at least start the Lakes Project. Truly worthy winners whose efforts will make a difference in our community and benefit us all. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of Community Louisiana on Your View. Thanks so much for watching and be sure to go out and make a difference in your community today. I'm Tracy White and I'll see you next time. <music>